Hello, everybody. I'm Larry Rogers. I'm uh, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, and I'm really pleased to welcome our remote audience today to this flash panel entitled The End of Row, question mark, Understanding the Leaked Supreme Court Ruling on Abortion Rights. This is another in an ongoing series of flash panels sponsored by the College of Liberal Arts, uh, overseen by the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion, whose goal is to take hot button, highly contentious, timely, controversial issues of the moment and bring research and fact-based inquiry to the table and helping our audiences better understand things. They've had past panels on, for example, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, on racism and social protests in light of events around the Black Lives Matter, on Trump's impeachment. You know, and while these events help audiences make sense of complex topics that have lots of cultural, political, and social currency, they serve, I think, a much larger purpose in modeling the ways in which universities and scholars inside them go about addressing these topics. They use their skills and in scholarly inquiry to cut through opinions, to cut through fake news, cut through biased perspectives, to say, in essence, here's the received verified wisdom on these topics as we debate them and as we try to address differences of opinion and differences of thinking and theory around these. You know, this is really important because we're in the midst of a time and when lots of people are finding it very, very hard to get along, where things have never been more polarized, where we can choose our communities of interest, our social media feeds, our journalistic preferences in such a way as we can essentially filter out all the scent, speak only to those to whom we agree, with whom we agree, and curate ourselves in a sense that we have everybody inside that world of curation that agrees with us and those who don't, well, you know, it's easy to say what, they're idiots, right? And that's a lousy recipe for democracy. It's a lousy recipe for living in the community. It's a lousy recipe for working inside a university. We all need to find ways to talk across disagreements, even around the most contentious of issues. And I believe that these flash panels are doing essential work helping us do that. I'm eager to hear today's panel. To kick things off, what I'm gonna do right now is turn it over to our moderator, Katie Bosendahl. Katie's a professor of sociology. She's director of the School of Public Policy. She brings an impressive research career to today's proceedings around investigating political and gender inequality. Her research demonstrates again and again that when women are politically, socially, and personally empowered, everyone everywhere benefits. And that is, I think, a striking statement of introduction to today's topic. Here's Katie Bosendahl. Thank you so much, Dean Rogers. It's really a pleasure to be here and to be working with such talent. I want to welcome all of the audience members to this panel uh, and a very important interdisciplinary discussion of the context and impl implications of the leaked Supreme Court opinion. This opinion from Justice Alito indicates that the Supreme Court is poised to nullify the landmark Roe versus Wade decision, that the Constitution of the United States protects a pregnant woman's liberty to choose to have an abortion without excessive government restriction. Today, we come together as political, sociological, historical, and public health experts to offer our insights on this issue and discuss the implications. Before I introduce our panelists, I want to acknowledge that the land we use as Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon, is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Ompinefu Band of Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are a part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Silence Indians. Thank you, Dean Rogers, for introducing me. I will be moderating this panel with the following panelists. Dr. Rory Spill Solberg is Associate Professor of Political Science specializing in judicial politics. She co-authored Media, the Court and Misrepresentation and edited Open Judicial Politics. She teaches courses on constitutional law, gender and law and judicial process and politics. Kelsey Kreshmer is an Associate Professor in Sociology who studies movements, organizations and gender politics. She wrote Fighting for Now, Diversity and Discord in the National Organization for Women. 
Amy Collinger is an associate professor in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion. Her work explores religious embodiment and racial justice in Christianities in the United States. Carrie Mays is an assistant professor of history in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion, and has taught courses in women, gender, and sexuality studies. Her research focuses on maternal and infant health in 20th century Brazil. David Rothwell holds the Barbara Knudsen Chair in Family Policy and is Associate Professor of Human Development and Family Sciences at OSU. He is leading a study of Oregon's paid family leave policy, specifically on how low-income families manage work, provide family care, and use the social safety net. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that we will be having a frank conversation about difficult topics, including sexual assault and violence. First, each of the panelists will give a short presentation based on their expertise. And then I will pose questions posted in the Q&A chat space. So I, I invite you to post your questions there. Dr. Solberg, can you please start us off? Sure, thank you, Katie, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm tasked today with, to, with talking about the Supreme Court and in preparing, I found myself a little bit perplexed on where I should go with this short, with these short remarks. There's been a lot of coverage of the leaked initial draft of the opinion and the potential implications of that opinion. So I don't want to rehash that, but I'm happy to answer questions about it during the Q&A. Um, so I thought I would just make some general remarks about the current situation and some of the implications as I see them. First, about the Supreme Court and what this initial draft can tell us about the court as an institution. I'm, I'm worried, quite frankly, that we can deduce that the current court might be undergoing a dramatic shift in its norms. Um, you know, after the leak of the draft opinion, I was shocked, very shocked by the breach of those norms as well as by the extremity of the opinion. But I, like many commentators, sort of noted that this was the first draft and the opinion writing process at the court is a long and winding road of compromise and redraft. Then yesterday, uh, Politico reported yet another kind of leak that the initial draft is still the only draft for the Dobbs case. Um, and I had to reassess what this leaked opinion may, and I wanna underscore may, uh, tell us about the current Supreme Court. If the February 10th draft has not been changed into, in response to requests by other justices in the usual method of bargaining and accommodation that opinion writing goes through, um, as justices say, oh, you know, I like this part, but can you change this? Can you add this? And if you do, then maybe I'll sign on. And that, you know, gives us another draft of the opinion. Um, then perhaps more than the norm of secrecy is sort of crumbling at the Supreme Court. Again, majority opinions are generally compromise opinions, taking into account the views of the justices that are willing to sign on. Generally speaking, the justices like to have as big of a majority as possible. And strategically, you can often accommodate those in the middle, somewhat at least without losing those who are already on side. But Alito's draft, it seems, is not trying to accommodate anyone additional to the four that have already signed on or at least voted in his favor based on the Chief Justice comments, no one has signed on yet. Um, so the idea that no other drafts are circulating suggests that he does not necessarily care to add to his majority um, or that um, he doesn't care whether the opinion would be stronger or more legitimate if he had Roberts or Breyer or Kagan sign on. So this suggests, again, a breakdown in the normal processes and the collegiality of the court, as well as a breakdown of the normal strategic bargaining that keeps the court working well, keeps the court collegial. Um, and that's a bit worrisome to someone who studies the court aside from the implications of the draft opinion and what that would mean. Second, um, thinking further out in terms of if this is the opinion or something similar is the opinion, sort of what are next steps? Um, 
we saw that the Democrats in Congress tried to pass a, a Women's Health Protection Act, which failed. They knew it would fail. Um, but there's also been some discussion on the GOP side that if in the midterms they were to regain control of Congress, they would try to pass a ban on abortions that would be nationwide. Uh, Mitch McConnell, Mitch, sorry, Mitch McConnell um, has now walked that back, stating that it's unlikely because, again, like the Democrats, the Republicans wouldn't have the 60 votes to push forward um, a national abortion ban. But let us just entertain the idea that suppose they could. Um, if the GOP did pass a federal abortion ban, how would the Supreme Court handle it when that law is challenged? Because I have no doubt that it would be. Um, you might be thinking that given the draft of the current opinion in the Dobbs case and the current makeup of the court, that the justices would, justices would easily find a national abortion ban constitutional. However, I would argue that's not the case. While the project to overturn Roe has been a mainstay and sort of prime impetus for the conservative legal movement for many, many years slash decades, um, it's not their only concern. The same legal approach that says there is no right to abortion in the constitution also has a much more circumscribed view on the powers of the federal government, in particular, the reach of Congress. So during the Rehnquist court and continuing through the Roberts court, which is where we are now, there has been a movement to curb congressional overreach, particularly the reach Congress has through the Commerce Clause. Indeed, when the court upheld the Affordable Care Act under, uh, during the Obama administration, they did so under Congress's power to tax and spend, not under its Commerce Clause powers, which is where um, Congress really wanted to seat that law. So the question can be, under what authority would Congress ban abortions? Well, it's the same authority that Congress tried and failed to use to codify abortion this week. It's that Commerce Clause. The connection between abortion access or abortion provision and interstate commerce is, from the court's perspective, about as close as the connection between guns near schools and violence against women, right? Again, in the ACA case, the Affordable Care Act case, the court dealt with the constitutionality of the individual mandate that everyone has to get insurance and noted that as expansive as the commerce power may be, it doesn't extend to the creation of a market so that it can then be regulated. So a federal abortion ban would pit two important parts of the conservative legal agenda against each other. And I'm not so sure once they've overturned Roe and the states have the power to regulate as they see fit, that the justices would be, a will, be, would be willing to give Congress this broad power over commerce, even in pursuit of a national abortion ban, where they generally haven't allowed Congress to go before. Abortion care is part of medical treatment, and that is usually under the police powers of the state. As we well know here in Oregon, since the court told the federal government, it didn't have the power to interfere with our physician's assisted suicide law for those very same reasons. So while the federal government has the power to regulate drugs, medical and otherwise, because it's in interstate commerce, it doesn't have the power to overrule or abrogate state laws on appropriate medical care. Similarly, it's unclear whether the states have the power to determine whether providers can use federal mail systems to send medications or prevent people from traveling in interstate commerce or just traveling from state to state in general because traveling for interstate commerce is under Congress's power. The federal mails are under Congress's power and the right to travel has been ceded by the Supreme Court um, in our privileges and immunities of the 14th Amendment um, as, as far back, well, as far back as 1999. So a lot of the implications are going to come up against other constitutional rights or other constitutional powers, and there will be um, the ability to work out exactly how this post row world will work. Um, that's probably about my time, so I'm going to hand it over to Kelsey. Thanks, Dr. Solberg. Dr. Kreshmer? Yes, I, I will share my screen. 
Um, I assume that that's that people can see that okay, but please let me know if that's not true. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, my job for today was to think about uh, what the movements around abortion look like. So that would be both sort of the feminist side of the movement and the um, the anti-abortion uh, movement. So I'm going to think about that in kind of three parts. Before Roe versus Wade was decided, what did these movements look like? After Roe was decided, what did these movements look like? And sort of where are we going now? So what you see in front of you is sort of a map. This map shifts over time, but this is sort of in the years right before Roe versus Wade was decided in 1973. This is what the map looked like for abortion. So as you can see in the vast majority, not the vast majority, but in the majority of, of states, it was illegal. It was sort of legal in cases of danger to the woman's health, uh, rape, incest, and also sort of severe fetal abnormality. Uh, you could, if you were a person needing abortion, you could feasibly get one, uh, some, so some restrictions, and then only sort of legal upon request in four states, Washington, Alaska, Hawaii, and then New York, which ends up being sort of the most important state in terms of being both spurring what would become uh, the abortion rights movement and also as a magnet for people needing abortions who, who would go there. So the important part about this map is that it indicates something important about the movements before Roe was decided, which is essentially there was no anti-abortion movement because there didn't really need to be one. Um, if you were a person needing an abortion, most states had at least some, um, it was, if you could prove that it was going to damage a woman's health, you could go to a hospital and um, abortions happened in hospitals if they were done by a doctor uh, to an abortion committee who would decide if you were a person deserving of an abortion and you would go through that process, but it was overwhelmingly not widely available. It was a private procedure. It happened not in freestanding clinics, but in hospitals. And so the, the situation was far different than what it looks like now. Uh, and I should say the vast majority of women, the, the data are quite clear on this, the vast majority of people who wanted an abortion were not able to get one under the system. Um, so on the abortion rights side, it also didn't exist in the same way it exists now. So um, overwhelmingly, uh, it would, um, you know, it was, I did interviews with women who were active in the movement at this point, so I think like 1960s uh, during the sort of cresting second wave. And the women at that point who were talking to me decades later said, oh, it was like a word you whispered to your sister if you knew somebody who had had one. It was not a public conversation. And this was also true for the women who were in the feminist movement. They were not, by and large, not even they were comfortable talking about this and they didn't see it as so tied to their, their feminist politics. New York is important here, again, because there was a group of women mainly on the East Coast and mainly in New York who were pressing the new feminist organizations to take up the issue. Um, and they were starting to, but the, the movements in this period don't look anything like what we think of uh, as, as we do now. Abortion just didn't exist in the public mind the way it does now. All right. So this is what that same map looked like, looks like as of the beginning of May, right? So still, but also we know that this is, uh, there is a significant chance that this map is going to change again. Um, so what did Roe change about those movements? So it, it's important to note that the Roe decision was a shock to everybody, feminists included, even the feminists who really wanted uh, abortion to be widely available to the people who need it. They did not expect a victory this stunning and this complete so quickly or maybe ever. Um, but the feminist movement consolidated around reproductive rights and then that morphed over time into reproductive freedom and reproductive justice to sort of pay attention to all of the ways people and mainly women have their uh, reproductive capacity constrained and controlled and that that sort of blossomed to include things like forced sterilization. So the, the movement, the feminist movement really embraced uh, reproductive justice as a part of its core. And 
the the decision Roe really gave birth, no pun intended, gave birth to the anti-abortion movement as we know it now. Um, it was mainly led by religious groups, so um, there are certainly people on the panel who will talk more about this than than I will. Um, largely led by religious groups, including lots of women who were worried. Right, so we can't frame this as women versus men, right? There are women on both sides of this issue and there are men on both sides of this issue. There are lots of women in the anti-abortion movement who were worried about what feminism was doing to their status in society. So if, um, you know, worried about declining patriarchy and their sort of place as honored matriarchs or like, you know, wives and mothers that that status was being eroded and the loosening sexual mores and the family breakdown with loosening divorce laws. Abortion was lumped together with all of those other things and then captured by the, uh, the, the burgeoning new right at the time. So I also want to note that the mainstream pro-life organizations, anti-abortion organizations started really working the Republican Party and Republican politicians and before Roe, it was not as partisan, cleanly partisan as it is now. There were a significant number of prominent Republicans who were pro-choice and identified as pro-choice, including George Bush the first and Ronald Reagan over time. And Jesse Jackson was very prominent in among pro-life circles uh, relating to his religious beliefs. It wasn't until a crossover in the 80s where it becomes really cleanly partisan. Um, and, and the mainstream pro-life movement, anti-abortion movement really focused on the, on the Republican party. So what you see on this map is that kind of result, this patchwork of you can only, uh, the Roe v. Wade decision said you can regulate abortion only after the point of viability. And that is a, decision made on a case by case basis made by doctors, but it, it tends to be interpreted differently in different places. And so you see that in some places there are no restrictions, Oregon being one of them. In some places there are very early restrictions. And then of course, most recently, Texas and Oklahoma have tried to take advantage of the current Supreme Court situation and push uh, the, um, uh, the boundary as early as they can to uh, the so-called heartbeat. Um, boundary where it's usually five or six weeks into a pregnancy, that's where they put their line. Uh, but the important part about this is that we end up with this map that nobody is happy with, and that feminists certainly would say abortion is not accessible in a map like this for the people who need it. And uh, the anti abortion side would say this is abortion is far too accessible for too many people. Uh, and this also leads us to a situation that we're most familiar with. These are pictures from um, the 80s all the way up until today with a variety of sort of, uh, this will be familiar to you, right? Like what the situation looks like now. Uh, the non-mainstream part of the anti-abortion movement moved hard into direct action. And sometimes that included violence towards clinics, bombing clinics, um, violence towards doctors and clinic staff. It always involved a lot of, um, and I should say often involved sidewalk, so-called sidewalk counseling, which is when protesters would either try to talk or block or yell at people going in to see uh, to receive abortion care. Um, and this was an innovation among the anti-abortion movement that then was followed by a pushback from uh, the pro-choice or abortion rights movement. And this is the dynamic, right, that these two movements just chase each other for decades through the different institutions trying to hamper each other and, and um, gain traction and then pull back on the traction uh, that the other movements make. Uh, and it's a real stalemate. And you, you see this stalemate in terms of public opinion as well, which is that if you ask people just straight, are you pro-life or pro-choice, you end up at almost always a roughly 50-50 split. And then if you get into the specifics, like, well, should it be allowed in this case or this case, right, rape, incest, health of the mother, viability, then you get a wide mix of opinions, but it's never a consensus in the public about where the, where the line should be, and it is a stalemate in all senses. All right. So we lived with that stalemate for decades, and now what, what will happen, right? What will happen if Roe gets overturned? 
I would argue, well, nobody knows, but I would argue that we're seeing it now, right? We see a, um, a, a large uprise in um, protesting and sidewalk counseling in front of Supreme Court justices' houses and personal residences. Um, and I think that what this indicates to me is that you're, we're going to see a diverging effect on the two movements, the anti-abortion movement and the pro-abortion rights movement. Where striking down Roe will almost certainly re-energize the feminist movement. I'm really curious about what young women will do who have sort of come to rely on the possibility of abortion, should they ever need it, to sort of make decisions about when to start families and how much education to pursue and what kind of jobs to go into, right? All of that, all of those generations of women have now relied on the availability of abortion, at least in theory, to make those decisions. And I wonder if they will be lots of women who were maybe hesitant to to claim a feminist identity might be more drawn to a movement once there's a more explicit case for why uh, what feminist the feminist movement has to offer. Um, and we are also years deep into a protest wave that really, you know, has roots before, but really got rolling during the Trump years. And so we have a generation of young people on top of the old people who remember, I'm sorry, older people who remember that fight for abortion rights the first time around. You have a generation of young people who are very comfortable with protests, who have now lived years in protests and, and I think are less sort of worried about public bro um, blowback about protest. And it also seems likely that, as we've seen, that the Democrats are going to be unlikely to be able to do anything at the national level to protect abortion rights. I think Roy makes a good point that Republicans are also not likely to be able to do much at the national level, but all of this puts people back into the streets over the issue. And then the, the last point I'll make is that the anti-abortion movement, the effect on the anti-abortion movement is, I think, a little unclear and not rosy. So on the one hand, they caught, they got the whale, right? They got their white whale. This was Roe versus Wade is what united a very diverse movement. And they all said, if we could just get this overturned, but now they lack another unifying goal. Uh, the goals that they could have left um, are really controversial and tricky to build a coalition around. So do you limit birth control? Do you limit, what about, the life and health of the mother, right? So a lot of things uh, devolving down to the states and then trying to find new consensus is like uh, is going to be a difficult thing for that movement. So I think they are likely in for a hard a hard time. Obviously, this isn't a rosy picture for feminism, but or the abortion rights movement. But I think in terms of having a clear unifying goal, this does provide them with some momentum that the anti-abortion movement is likely to struggle with. So I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Collinger, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hi. Um, I'm going to read my comments because I'm afraid that I'll talk way too long because I have a lot to say. So um, uh, in the Washington Post recently, Jennifer Rubin argued that the term culture wars minimize the current threats in the United States. She suggested replacing the term culture wars with the term religious tyranny. Scholars in my field, North American religious history, have been sounding a similar alarm in some ways. Um, and we, in my field, we use the more descriptive term white Christian nationalism instead of the term religious tyranny. Um, and let me give you some context of how we define that. White Christian nationalism is the view that evangelical Christianity should be fused with civic life and that true Americans are white, culturally conservative and native born. This is not just a loose band of religious partisans. As Catherine Stewart has noted, white Christian nationalism is a dense organizational infrastructure. It has closely interconnected networks of right-wing policy groups, legal advocacy organizations, uh, leadership training initiatives, sophisticated data operations, networking groups, media and messaging platforms, all working together to promote their political aims. They also have very ultra wealthy bank people bankrolling them. Um, you can see some evidence of this, um, the power of this group in Ginny Thomas's infamous text to Mark Meadows attempting to overturn the 2020 election, their reflection of the reach of white Christian nationalism and also the language that they use with each other is quite distinctive um, and you can see it evidence there. 
Historians of American religion are increasingly alarmed at the ways that white Christian nationalism has become increasingly radical and extreme in its goals. It's moved from the edges to the center of the Republican Party. It embraces conspiracies and pursues anti-democratic violence as legitimate. Um, and that these ideologies are increasingly embedded in the institutions of government from the Supreme Court and Congress to slate legislatures in much of the country. Um, so I wanted to highlight for you some of the just very recent scholarly publications on this. And mostly what I'm going to do in my PowerPoints is just put up sources. For those of you who are interested, you can go deeper. Um, but this really is a conversation that in my field, we've spent a lot of the last year focusing on this issue. Um, Scholars, historians, social scientists, and experts in US religion um, are increasingly alarmed, and this is unusual for our field. We tend to be quite reticent about making claims about um, the role of religion in public space, but there's a growing sense of really concern, deep concern, um, about the extremism, the racism, the authoritarianism, and the anti-democratic focus of white Christian nationalism in the United States. And my field has a lot, devoted a lot of time and energy in the last year to dissecting and documenting this movement. Um, and if I could channel my academic field right now, we would be saying something akin to Greta Thunberg's famous quote about crime, climate change, quote, I want you to act as if your house is on fire because it is. Um, America, um, scholars of American religion want you to know your house is on fire. Um, there is a threat of historic proportions and overturning Roe v. Wade is just one small part of this. It's part of a larger, much larger project of white Christian nationalists trying to significantly and permanently alter American society. As a historian, I want you to stop looking at individual stars like the Roe decision um, and instead see the larger constellation because this is bigger than Roe. Our democracy itself and the pluralistic society that gives it life is in jeopardy like never before. Scholars of American religion who have been analyzing the entire constellation of white Christian nationalist policies know with certainty that abortion is simply one element of this movement's larger agenda. And as kind of pundits on TV say, well, you know, maybe the court decision will lead to undermining gay marriage. Um, people in my field say this is exactly where they're going for it. This is a strategic aim. Um, and that abortion was purposely and strategically chosen to be the starting point of cultural dominance. This is the start, this is not the end. Um, some of the other um, pieces of the political agenda of white Christian nationalists, I've listed them here, but let me highlight a few. Um, civil rights, white Christian nationalism is linked statistically to greater likelihood of subscribing to racist explanations of COVID-19, of opposing interracial marriage, of believing that black Americans deserve whatever violence they receive from police, and believing that any socioeconomic inequality Black Americans face is due to their own shortcomings. This also can be seen in efforts by this group to, op to oppose the Black Lives Matter movement, um, the hysteria around what they call critical race theory, which um, they don't seem to really understand what it is that they're talking about, but the hysteria about this and the educational gag orders they've put in place. In addition, there's a linked opposition to sexual and gender self-expression, um, including LGBTQ tr rights, trans rights, and the right of marriage equality. Rebecca Davis wrote in the LA Times recently, quote, it is not a historical accident that a likely Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe has coincided with these other assaults on sexual freedom and gender identity. The legal right to abortion is but one issue, if a critical one, at the heart of a much larger struggle for sexual autonomy. And again, we have we can see this in legislatures um, in educational gag orders, banning books in Florida and other places, criminalizing parents supporting gender affirming medical care for their children. Right. Roe is just one part of this agenda. In addition, this group also, um, as you can see, has a significant overlap with people who follow QAnon conspiracies. Fully 73% of people who um, agree with QAnon um, also embrace Christian nationalism. There's also related efforts to roll back voting rights. Um, more, the more strongly that white Americans affirm Christian nationalist principles, the more likely they were to respond to Trump's election loss with a view that voting access should be restricted. All right, all of this is built on a false portrait of US history. White Christian nationalism is built on mythologies of profoundly inaccurate distortions of US history. 
and they're telling the US was one, founded as a Christian nation by white Protestants. Two, our laws and institutions are based on Protestant Christianity. Three, America has a divine mission to spread Christianity, freedom, and capitalism throughout the world. Four, God favored America in the past because it carried out that mission. Five, the increasing presence of racial, religious, cultural, and sexual others, basically anyone who's not white, heterosexual, cisgender, and Christian, alters Christian culture and invites God's judgment on the whole nation. And six, getting back to Roe, abortion is a central battleground between a godly Christian American past and the looming godless woke moral anarchy um, of the future in their view. Each of these points is demonstrably historically false, as I emphasize in all of my courses, but they hang together as a mutually reinforcing narrative of myths that undergird white Christian nationalism, and they are believed to be absolutely true by significant numbers of Americans. And historians and scholars of American religion who confront these historical inaccuracies with corrective data and analysis are dismissed as illegitimate purveyors of critical race theory or worst. Um, and again, white Christian nationalism attempts to censor and dismiss any information that confronts or challenges their inaccurate historical mythologies. Um, and this is also deeply related to the banning um, of the teaching of American systemic racism in public schools. It's why it's so important in the constellation of goals of white Christian nationalism. All right. Another point, banning abortion is a white Christian nationalist strategy to solidify political power, and it has been since the 1970s. Randy Balmer, himself an evangelical, has ably and definitively documented that opposition to abortion is not the issue that created the pol political coalition of white evangelicals that we now think of as the religious right. Balmer has said, quote, both before and for several years after Roe, evangelicals were overwhelmingly indifferent to the subject. Um, so they give a self-explanation that they rose to moral outrage when Roe happened. Um, the truth, historical truth, is that that's a mythology that they've consciously um, chosen to, to put out there. The real um, issue underneath what really rallied um, members of white Christian nationalists and right-wing cultures is desegregation. Um, Conservative evangelicals banded together when it appeared that they were going to lose tax exempt status for their racially segregated religious schools that they created in the wake of Brown versus Board of Education. But segregation was a losing issue in the public debate. So leaders of the newly formed religious right tested various issues until they came to abortion as a cause that could be used to mobilize political activism for the other causes that they wanted. This is a bait and switch. And this bait and switch has meant that white supremacy has been festering unattended in American evangelical culture ever since. Many historians are noting this. For many scholars in my field, this, is a, this deeply embedded racism helps explain the overwhelming support of white evangelicals for Donald Trump in 2016. Now, why is this all so concerning? Oh, it's not letting me force it. Go take a slide over. Let me try it again. Uh, well, without my slide, I'll just keep going. Um, white Christian nationalists believe that their divinely appointed agenda trumps, and the pun is, pun is intended, democratic process. The January 6th insurrection was a preview of their tactics. There are two, and I have a slide to show you, repositories of data and analysis documenting the centrality of white Christian nationalism to the January 6th insurrection. And this cannot be overstated. The images, the t-shirts, the slogans, the chants, the organizations blowing the shofar, um, all of these are connected um, into, right, connect the January 6th insurrection to white Christian nationalism. Um, there's a, a telling portrait um, of a woman in a QAnon t-shirt who carried two signs, one saying, we love Trump, and the other saying, we love America, God, and babies. Um, from the Jericho March that prefaced January 6 riots to the current efforts to limit voting rights, white Christian nationalism is working to ensure that they have control of government offices and institutions, and this is why scholars are worried. Continuing efforts to challenge the election, a significant portion of evangelical Christians believe that the 2020 election was stolen, and they advocate for violence to correct this. 
Finally, this group is not going away. Don't believe that just because um, the percentage of nuns or people who claim no religious affiliation in the US population is growing, that white Christian nationalism is going to head toward the exit. The manipulations of the voting system are intended to ensure that a minority of highly motivated religious activists and voters can control the institutions and operations of government. One of the main scholars of this, Philip Gorski, has said, quote, it's a very serious threat. The Christian right has taken a sharp authoritarian turn in recent years for many reasons. White Christians Nationalism is a dangerous threat because it's incredibly well organized and powerful. There's absolutely nothing like it on the left. White Christian nationalists boast local and national networks that can raise money and turn people out to polls and national school board meetings. They can effectively communicate messages and coordinate policies that are out of step with liberal democracy, such as the attack, coordinated attack on voting rights. Um, Finally, um, lest you think this is far away, um, in April, they had a rally uh, just outside of Salem, the quote, Reawaken America tour um, that boasted a whole host of, of Christian, white Christian nationalist leaders. Um, okay, finally, three last thoughts that I can follow up in the Q&A if you want. Um, a, um, this is not just evangelicalism, some portion of a deeply bifurcated U.S. Catholicism and lots of other mainline denominations like the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod have also been infected by white Christian nationalism. Um, to the role of Roman Catholicism, which is actually my area of expertise um, in Roe, um, is a very complicated one. Um, so uh, it bears a kind of longer conversation. And three, um, I have heard people make references to um, white Christian nationalists as the American Taliban, or right talking about a, um, a, a you know a, a religious fatwa. Um, I would ask you to please reconsider that kind of language. White Christian nationalism is its own thing. Um, it can, needs to be addressed and named as often as it can be. Um, and also making these kind of comparisons between Islam and white. Christian nationalism um, are problematic and unhelpful. They also, I think, feed into Islamophobic um, ideas about Muslimism, about Islam in the public sphere. So um, let's call it white Christian nationalism. Let's not um, compare it to other things. And let's all um, start paying attention to what's happening. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Mays. Thank you so much. And um, thank you to all the organizers for um, facilitating this really critical conversation for all of you for being here today. Uh, I'm going to take us outside the United States for a moment. My goal is to outline what criminalized abortion looks like in Brazil, which is the country where my research is focused and where I've studied and lived for a number a number of times over the last 20 years. Um, I don't, I'll say I don't pretend to speak for Brazilian women or anyone with reproductive capacity in Brazil. I'm just offering these insights from my own research and engagement with reproductive policy making and its histories in Brazil. And I, I offer these out almost as a cautionary tale um, or even perhaps a roadmap for possible outcomes if we continue to see the advance towards the criminalization of abortion here in the United States. Um, and we've already seen some attempts like this. You're probably familiar with SB8 in Texas and the uh, essentially mimic law that is um, being proposed in its neighbor, Oklahoma now. So hopefully this will give us um, some food for thought or some instructive lessons to take away so what is the general reproductive rights landscape in Brazil today? Um, and what, again, what can we take away as insights uh, amidst this ongoing rollback of reproductive sovereignty in the US? Um, since 1940, Brazil's penal code has criminalized abortion with only two exceptions, one being the exception for rape or sexual assault, and the other being in instances where the pregnancy threatens the life of the mother. And you might be saying to yourself, wow, that sounds pretty progressive for 1940, even more so than some of the policies that are being proposed in conservative states in 2022 um, in the United States. But I'd urge us, um, and what my research kind of digs into, is that these also really reflect the religious and social and political mores of the time that were highly patriarchal. So the exception for rape was really done in the interest of preserving the concept of female honor, right? And as, as you know, Brazil is a, a majority Catholic country, although that is changing um, where we see the uh, intense rise of the evangelical population as well. 
Um, the exception for preserving the life of the mother uh, was also important for the political agenda of the time in 1940 because Brazil, in an interest of developing and of populating its vast interior, um, was highly pro-natalist. Um, so the idea of preserving the life of a mother amidst a threatening you know, life-threatening pre pregnancy was to preserve her fertility for future pregnancies. Um, so even where we see these two exceptions, we might think that they're quite progressive. They really did reflect the patriarchal political agenda of the time. Um, in 2012, another exception was added to include cases of fetal anencephaly, um, which is a malformation of the skull and brain that is incompatible with life. You all may be familiar with, um, in 2016, another revision that came out having to do with the uh, Zika microcephaly epidemic uh, in, in Latin America and particularly in Brazil. So this was done in recognition of the fact that the Zika virus could cause fetal microcephaly. Um, and so this exception allowed anyone infected with Zika to be able to choose to end their pregnancy without criminal penalties. Um, it also guaranteed access to contraception and healthcare um, for those infants who were affected by microcephaly. There was a fierce debate in Brazil at this time it, during the Zika epidemic. Uh, surveys actually revealed that the majority of Brazilians did not approve of these exceptions for cases of um, Zika infection. Uh, at the same time, you had the UN and even the Pope, who is from Argentina, um, urging for this relaxation and to allow abortions during the Zika outbreak. So these divergent attitudes really reflect the enduring reality surrounding reproductive rights in Brazil and elsewhere in Latin America. Um, one reproductive rights advocate captured it quite well by saying that abortion seekers in Brazil, a majority Catholic country, find themselves trapped between o pecado e o crime, which means that they're trapped between this religious moral idea of sin on one side and the very real possibility of being charged with a crime on the other. Um, recently, in the last couple of years, under the presidency of Jair Bolsonaro since 19, or 2019, the government has introduced more than 30 new restrictive measures um, around abortion. So we can see that those politics are kind of amping up under Bolsonaro. He also very famously named a pro-life uh, evangelical pastor as his ministry uh, to his ministry of women, family, and human rights. Uh, we also see a very similar backlash, and so it's interesting that I'm following Amy because we see some parallels between the U.S. and Brazil here. Um, whenever these uh, abortion cases come up and gain national attention, we see the same backlash from Brazil's evangelical sector, which, as I said, has been growing over the last 30 years or so. One example of this came um, from a flashpoint case in 2020 in which a 10-year-old incest survivor became pregnant and had health complications. She was denied an abortion locally in her home state. Take, with, the case was taken to court and she was granted an abortion elsewhere outside of her state at 22 weeks. Um, in that case, she had to be taken there clandestinely, um, but religious evangelical protesters stormed the hospital attempting to intervene and called her an assassin. Um, wow. Bolsonaro's minister, the evangelical pastor that I mentioned, said publicly that the child should have had that baby through a C-section. So what does criminalization actually look like? Brazil gives us an interesting case to look at. What is it like in an everyday sense? Um, and what effects does criminalization have on health and reproductive justice in Brazil? Um, and so here's where we might gain some understanding of what criminalization could look like. What would some of its effects be? Um, in Brazil, abortion seekers, if they're found to be terminating clinically or with medication or by any other means, they can be sentenced to one to th for one to three years. Um, and there are even longer sentences for those who help someone procure an abortion, either a provider or um, you know, someone who facilitates it or pays. Um, they can receive up to 10 years uh, in prison for that. And the highest sentences come for people who induce an abortion without consent. So if you are giving someone an abortion inducing drug, abortifacient drug, without their knowledge, you, you get the highest sentences. Uh, the more, majority of abortion seekers are denounced actually or turned in, in medical context. So in clinics, they're turned in by medical staff, doctors, nurses. Um, and this usually happens in the course of seeking follow-up care from a clandestine abortion. About 250,000 women are hospitalized due to a complication from an abortion every year. 
Um, the best estimates that we have are that there are anywhere from 800,000 to a million abortions, illegal abortions a year. And again, how it's very difficult to track that data, um, but those are the best estimates. Among those, there are also several hundred deaths per year as a result of these clandestine high risk abortions. And again, numbers of death are difficult. There have even been high profile cases where illegal clinics and providers um, who are usually not doctors um, hide the body, right, uh, of someone who does not survive. So you can imagine what that does to the public's trust in the medical and healthcare system, such that if you, uh, you know, seek an abortion, get an abortion, either um, by taking misoprostol or a clinical abortion, um, you are disincentivized from going to a clinic if you have complications because you could then be turned in in that setting. In reality, few abortion seekers actually end up going to prison. Brazil is famously has a very overcrowded prison system and they have a very clogged court system. Um, most people who are charged with abortion never even go to trial, but are put on a type of probation or given community service. The majority of them have no prior criminal record, so they face fewer penalties. Um, and the profile of those seeking abortion in Brazil looks strikingly similar to what it does in the U.S. Most are already parents, already have at least one child. They're between the ages of 20 and 29. Um, in Brazil, they're usually um, people of color or, or mixed race. Um, in terms of frequency, one 2019 study revealed that there's at least one abortion case before the courts every two days. And in terms of more aggregate data between 2015 and 2018, there were about 1300 cases that came before the courts. But I'd like to note, you know, so even if you don't go to prison, right, you can still be charged, but even if you don't end up going to prison, um, there's still a trauma associated with being denounced to the courts, in addition to that erosion of trust within um, the medical context, right, with doctors or uh, health professionals. Just going through the adjudication process and having a criminal record can create those kinds of traumas. Um, and we also see here something that's so important that directly applies to the U.S. because Brazil, just like the U.S., is a post-abolition society, right? Brazil was the number one country um, taking in 5 million of the 12 million slaves that crossed the Atlantic um, over 300 years. Um, and so they have a similar society where we see a correlation between race and class. Um, and so those who are Afro-Brazilian or black and mixed race oftentimes are at a disproportionate rate of suffering from um, the effects of an illegal abortion. And so they are then disproportionately the ones who are charged with those crimes. Um, so we can see the class and racial repercussions here. Um, women who can pay for a safe clinical abortion, who are usually wealthier and whiter, they're less likely to end up in the hospital following those abortions. Their black mixed race and poor counterparts are more susceptible to those high risk options. And consequently, they end up in the hospital and end up being denounced by the staff or uh, in many cases end up dying from those illegal procedures. One legal scholar in Brazil calls the criminalization of abortion a quote unquote social disaster while most public health professionals consider it to be a major public health crisis. The biggest point that I want to, to share for our thinking about the implications in the US is that criminalization does little to nothing to curtail abortion overall. A 2010 study showed that one in five uh, women in Brazil have at least one abortion by the time they're 40. Um, and as I said, conservative estimates are that there are around 800,000 clandestine abortions per year. Um, and we all hear the same phrase, you can only ban safe abortion, and that's extremely true in Brazil. Um, and I wanna just end by giving a quick nod to the fact that you know a lot of us are talking about the policy level um, and regardless of the national level laws in these countries, either the US or Brazil, um, it's important that we pay attention to the fact that women and their allies fight continually and have done so forever <laughs> for reproductive rights and reproductive justice. And they have built amazing mutual aid networks to be able to access abortion, even amidst the most restrictive top-down policies um, to access abortion and contraception options to protect one another in these restrictive circumstances. Um, there are now, for example, community groups that help crowdfund to get abortion seekers across the border to Argentina, which legalized in the last year. 
Um, so it's important that we recognize and maybe take inspiration from the fact that just as top-down conservative-led efforts um, have been a constant over the last century, so too have we heard the constant drumbeat of grassroots resistance movements. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rothwell. Okay, hi everybody, and um, thanks Katie for organizing. And um, I, I realize that I'm standing in between uh, everyone in the Q&A, so I'll try and um, condense this as much as I can. Um, so I'm gonna talk about family policy and um, you know, I'm gonna end up suggesting that undoing Roe is gonna um, ultimately deviate from a historical pattern of, of family policy that we've seen. It's gonna increase inequality between states and um, you know, it's gonna reduce economic security for low-income mothers. So I'm just gonna say a few things on those points. Most of this is um, you know, speculating what, what would happen um, if, uh, you know, if the ruling is overturned. So the first thing is that it, you know, this idea of restricting freedom represents um, a family policy paradox. So by family policy, I mean, um, you know, legislative policies that have to do with family formation and reproduction, caregiving, economic support, partner relationships, and child rearing. Are, those are the main topics. And so um, basically the overturning Roe would, um, you know, is based on the idea of returning the authority to the people and their elective representatives. And um, my understanding is that there would be about 13 states that would be uh, quickly positioned to overturn that. So most of what I'm talking about is, is focused on what would happen if those 13 states overturned, um, you know, if they allowed, um, or sorry, if they barred abortion. So this transition, though, um, counters historical liberal conservative positions on family policy. So liberal and conservative views about family policy tend to follow and be consistent with views about the government. Traditional conservative family policies include personal responsibility, inherent in the work requirements, time limits and sanctions that were included in the 1996 welfare reform. Another example is choice in schooling and charter schools and private and market solutions to childcare. On the liberal side, uh, liberal policies include expanding um, you know, anti-poverty measures such as the child tax credit during the pandemic, broadening access to public health insurance through the um, uh, Affordable Care Act and providing um, you know, family and medical leave, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, so overall, when, when conservatives are advocating for states to play a more active role, um, in, in what has been a private family decision for, for nearly 50 years, this signals a, a, a change and a, a deviation from historical patterns in family policy. That's the first point. The second point is that allowing states to regulate um, reproductive rights of women will increase inequality, already high inequality between states. And I know uh, we know this, um, you know, Kelsey showed a, a map, and if you think about um, in, in a lot of areas, uh, there's already existing inequalities, but um, these will exacerbate those and, and it's problematic for overall social welfare. So we know that health and well being of families is shaped by structural factors, and undoing Roe would increase those. States have always had considerable control over family policy, but there's been a trend toward this. You know, since the 70s, since Roe, following on the heels of Watergate and the rise of Reagan, um, you know, we see a pattern of devolution and more responsibility and control um, by states. Just as individuals have become more polarized in their political views, states have trended away from a, set, a center line. Cash assistance for families with children and health insurance access is largely determined by the state one lives. In the 1996 welfare reform that ended AFDC and turned it into TANF, um, states are now given wide discretion on how they spend their welfare dollars. For example, the share of welfare spending uh, on basic assistance, cash assistance, now varies from 4% to 68%. So you have, that's the low and the high. Oregon is kind of in the middle at 
spending around 34% of its um, TANF dollars on cash assistance to help families. The Affordable Care Act is another example in, in 12 states. Many of them are the same states where um, you know, abortion would be um, illegal. Uh, these states did not expand Medicaid. In other areas, such as family leave, states have responded to the lack of federal policy by establishing state-specific, and Oregon is one of those. Overall, the, the patchwork of availability in these states and not others has produced really high levels of inequalities and outcomes. The poverty rate is 15% in Mississippi and only 5% in Minnesota. The likelihood of maternal mor mortality is over four times larger in Arkansas than it is in Illinois. The average life expectancy in West Virginia is seven years less um, than Hawaii. By enabling states to regulate abortion, the court ruling will increase social inequalities across the country. One, one's ability to exercise choice over reproduction, like poverty and health access now, will be largely determined by geographic residents. Across the state border and the same American family will have access to far more or far fewer resources and limitations on their free will. So that's the second point. The third point is that um, the lack of family policies in these states where this is expected to happen is going to lead to significant economic insecurity for families. So the increasing numbers of work of women in the workforce, mothers in the workforce has has transformed family life in the past uh, century. This shift has resulted in more economic security for women and a closing of the gender pay gap. Women's er earnings have increased over the past 40 years. And if we just, I just did a back of the envelope calculation since 1973, overall women's um, uh, earnings have increased 40% in the, sorry, in the labor, uh, labor force participation rate. So there's been major changes and gains in employment and um, a reduction in inequality comparing men to women. Without access to abortion, these unintended pregnancies will result in more births and those more births will be concentrated among teens and race, racial ethnic minorities. Around the time of birth, all working mothers must take leave, paid or unpaid from work or exit the workforce entirely to care for a new child. In this way, motherhood disrupts economic security for many especially those uh, new mothers who lack access to paid leave or who lack access to partners to support those lost wages. The draft ruling argues that increased demand for adoption might um, make, um, would, demand for adoption would um, make abortion less necessary and that adoption may play a role in offsetting some of these economic gains. However, that assertion is entirely undocumented by social science unlike the strong causal relationship that has been established by abortion access and increased employment and reduced poverty. There's actually a good list of that social science evidence um, that was um, listed in the, in the court documents. Um, additionally, this would ignore the psychosocial complications that come along with pregnancy and birth um, that would go along with adoption. Overall, family policies, specifically economic supports, can play a strong role in off offsetting some of these market vulnerabilities. But the 13 states where abortion bans are expected to take place offer some of the most stringent safety net and insufficient work family balances. For over 100 families in poverty in these states, just nine, nine of 100 receive that cash welfare assistance. Contrast that with Oregon, where it's about 50. So, um, very few families are receiving cash assistance in those 13 states. So, you know, more evidence on policy suggests that states with larger percentages of black residents are less likely to provide cash assistance to the poor. And new research even shows a strong relationship between raci racist beliefs of blacks among whites and declining cash assistance. These are prominent issues in these 13 states. Poverty rates in these states are higher than the national average and none have any kind of paid family leave. So overall, considering the birth impacts and on economic livelihoods are large and concentrated among some of the most socially isolated and disadvantaged, overturning Roe is likely to reverse gains in gender and equality that have been made and exacerbate overall socio and economic disadvantage. Uh, so that's it for me, thank you.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. These were fantastic presentations. And I have uh, certainly a list of my own questions that I would be happy to ask. But I do want to um, respond to some of the questions that we've gotten um, from the audience. And I think one goes back to uh, Rory thinking about the Supreme Court, um, kind of a tree or like a, a set of related questions about what's what's going to be the the faith in the Supreme Court going forward for overturning um, a piece of the Constitution, you know, or, you know, uh, overturning a constitutional ruling. And, you know, is there precedent for something like this? And um, what's it going to mean for some of our other rulings? Okay, that's a lot of questions. Um, I think that, you know, uh, I was trying to, to write um, Taylor asked something about this, who, who's one of our alums. Hi, Taylor. Um, that I think there's sort of two, two effects that are happening at the same time. There's can be the effect of the leak on the legitimacy of the Supreme Court and the perception of the court as a political institution, and then the effect of a decision that overturns Roe versus Wade. And I think both of those are gonna have different effects. The, the leak itself can have an effect sort of across the board on the perception of the court as above politics and working differently because it's the kind of thing we associate with more of a political institution. Um, so I think the court is, is gonna take a hit there and they already have been taking hits. Um, the Supreme Court, if you don't know, is our institution that's had the highest public approval ratings since we've been measuring it. Um, they used to have a nice seat around 60% approval, and it's been dropping um, in, in more recent years to about 40%, and I would guess that we're going to see more dips. Um, so I think the leak is going to hurt the court, which is why John Roberts is so upset about it, because as Chief Justice, one of his roles is really to, to ensure the legitimacy continues of the court. Um, in terms of the decision, if the court overturns Roe versus Wade, um, I, yeah, I do think that they will take a hit, but it's going to be um, a polarized hit in the sense that the people who don't like that decision, they will have what we would call certainly low support for that decision. That's their specific support for that decision, which will um, affect their overall general support for the court. There's a correlation between your specific support and your diffuse support for the court as an institution. But for the people who are with the anti-choice movement, they are gonna like that decision and their support for the court is likely to increase. So while they're gonna take a hit, we don't know exactly how that will, will happen. And we saw actually um, the same thing when Roe versus Wade was actually decided. There was a GSS, uh, General Social Science Survey in the field with three waves, one before Roe and two after Roe. Um, and there were some questions about abortion and, and support for the court on that survey all the way back then. And the court overall stayed the same in terms of approval, but the people who were in favor of access to abortion, their support dropped and the people who were in favor, uh, I mean, their support rose and the people who were anti-choice, their support dropped. And so it was an overall zero. Um, I don't think you'll see that here because I think, again, as the public opinion polls show, there's a bigger difference on the two sides right now. Um, so I think that addresses the legitimacy question. What was the other parts? <laughs> well, I want to ask you, yeah, so I want to ask this, and I also want to maybe have Carrie reflect on this too, in terms of um, the, this could be the potential of the um, rollback of gay marriage rights, or seems like right. right. And I'm just yeah. so curious as to whether that, we've seen that in Brazil too, whether those things are tied to like a rejection of same-sex rights along with abortion. So maybe you could both speak to that. Yeah. Um, so I'll just, again, try to do this quickly. Um, if you read the draft opinion, Justice Alito tries to make a, a very clear statement that abortion is different and this, ha this precedent has nothing to do with any of these other things. Don't worry about it. It's all good. We're just dealing with this. So I have two comments about that. One, the court has done this more recently in some other areas, right? When the court decided Shelby 
County versus Holder, which um, undercut or gutted, depending on which side you're on, um, the Voting Rights Act. Um, they said, it's okay that we're getting rid of section five and, and that because you still have section two and section two will be available to you. And then they heard um, another case and then they said, oh, actually no, section two really isn't available either. So just because they say in one case, it doesn't have any implications, doesn't mean that other people won't bring those cases to the court and the court won't change their mind. Um, you know, in Bush versus Gore, they were very clear that this case will not set precedent for any other case. Guess what? Smart lawyers have used it and set precedent for other cases. Second, and I think more importantly, is that if you follow sort of the rubric that Alito gives us in terms of how they he decided this case and says, well, let's look at whether it's historically rooted Let's go back in time. What did we have at the founding, right? That does put lots of other issues um, on shaky ground because you can use that same legal analysis, that same originalism to look at same-sex marriage, to look at access to contraception, to look at um, choices about raising your children, all these sorts of areas that were covered under this rubric of the right to privacy. Um, and none of those were available at the time of the founding either. So um, I think if anybody were to look at that opinion and say, well, they say it's different, um, I would caution that that's not, you know, that's not a barrier to the court moving forward if they choose. We just don't know exactly you know, whether they would choose that. Yeah, I can say that they're, they are correlated and that the evangelical movement in Brazil ties those two issues together. Um, I know, you know, uh, well, first of all, same-sex marriage has been legal in Brazil since 2013. Um, but when Bolsonaro was elected and before he took office, there was a documented rush of same-sex partnerships going to get married because they feared that he would immediately overturn it. He, since his days as a military leader during the dictatorship, has been an outspoken, well, he calls himself a homophobe. Um, and he went on to then appoint people to his cabinet that reflect that kind of ideology. Um, but interestingly, in recent years, I think in 2019, Brazil Supreme Court actually upheld six out of 11 judges upheld um, the criminalization of transphobia and homophobia. Brazil's also the site of I think the world's largest gay pride parade in Sao Paulo. Um, and so there's a really, um, there has been since, you know, the latter part of the 20th century, a really robust gay rights movement. And that's now expanded to include, you know, trans rights. There's, um, you know, a, a, a plethora of these kinds of movements, but they are facing a similar onslaught from the federal government that's now led by um, a self-avowed homophobe. Um, there's also... Uh, a concurrent issue around gender as well. So some of the same conversations that we have been having, they were having at the same time um, around gender theory, right? And so trying to do revisions in the public education curriculum and to ban um, certain theories around gender um, from being taught in public schools. And then of course that also relates to sex education and what can be taught. And so we're having those same kinds of conversations here in the United States. So a ton of parallels we can draw, but I would just say, yes, they are correlated and kind of fit within that, as Amy said, constellation of things um, that the very vocal evangelical movement uh, uses as influence to, to sway politics, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that we can pick up from some of the other questions that we're getting. Um, and I, I'd like to hear um, both Kelsey and Amy talk about this a little bit in terms of the evangelical white nationalist movement in the US and kind of the fights that established Roe, um, Kelsey here in the US and things is to do with access to reproductive health care and contraception. So we had a question, for example, are we going to see efforts to prevent reproductive education in school, um, to um, take away access to contraception, which is really one of the most effective ways of preventing abortion, right? So um, how do some of those issues fit into what, what you all study and what you all know? 
I, I will just answer briefly and then hand it over to Amy. Uh, I would say there are efforts on all of these things. And the question is how much traction do they gain um, at the federal? Well, I will say that like long-term contraception, right? Contraception use is higher than it's ever been. There's long, right? Like abortion rates are actually lower than they have ever been since we've been keeping records as far as I know, because people are accessing birth control and using long acting birth control that prevents the need for abortion. Um, that doesn't do anything about the women who need abortions or the people who need abortions because of, you know, sort of catastrophic health concerns um, once they are pregnant with wanted pregnancies. But it doesn't seem so clear to me that even evangelical women are going to be willing to give up birth control. I don't, I, I don't, I, I could be wrong. I don't see that as a thing that they can unite around in a really strong way. Uh, and I don't, I think that at the federal level, they're like, if they do that, they're likely to get more traction at the state level. And exactly as David noted, the states that already uh, have sort of draconian rules around um, public health and welfare support and all of those things, Medicaid, they are likely to, if it gets traction, they're sort of limiting that, that's where it will happen. But at the, at the federal level, Republicans are almost as constrained as Democrats are in doing anything about the situation. So I'll let Amy answer too. Yeah, um, my thought is again, I, I appreciate Kelsey's thought that um, evangelical women probably won't um, embrace this. Um, I mean, it is, you know, if Catholicism is any model, there's a significant number of um, very religious um, women who right, um, are, um, prone to thinking about contraception as um, something that's illicit. And um, I was just reading yesterday about even some possibilities that the trigger laws that are in place if Roe is overturned um, could make IUDs illegal in some places um, because it prevents the implantation of a um, fertilized ovum. And so um, we, you know, there is the possibility. Um, and I think overall, um, Christian nationalists um, would very much like to see contraception um, more difficult for, to access and possibly become illegal, whether that's practical or not, or whether that can happen. Um, and there's another possibility, I think, um, that this would be an interesting point of mobilization, that those who don't feel like they need to be mobilized um, uh, politically if Roe is overturned would definitely become politically mobilized if the right to contraception is taken away. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I do think there's going to be far less education. Um, there could be far less contraception and sexual education in general in schools because there is right increasing gag orders or laws put in place, um, and and teachers are just worried about potentially violating any kind of law or norm or making a parent unhappy. So I think there already is this kind of cooling process and chilling process of people, teachers being will, less willing to talk about things. And um, I just wanna add that um, if we look at, you know, the slide that Amy had of all the different issue areas, the one that I didn't see on there that I would add from my perspective as someone who studies the court and teaches constitutional law is the continued efforts to, um, I would say make more porous the separation between church and state and bringing more um, religiosity into the public sphere and into the schools. And we see that with, with the case that's before the court right now in terms of prayer um, with the coach on the football field and exactly how we do this. And the, the, the switch in these, in these cases is instead of um, being concerned about the, the establishment of religion or the free exercise of the students, it's the free exercise of the teacher. Um, or the free exercise of the school board or the free exercise of, and, and how they want to live their religion sort of you know, out loud. Um, and again, regardless of, of how you feel about that, it is a switch in doctrine and would have implications for what's allowable in school and what kinds of education you can have and what kinds of materials you can have um, that I think would, would um, interact with, with what Amy has been saying. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because it is the dominance of just one religious view. As we know, 
the U.S. is a religiously pluralistic society, and many of the other religious traditions in the U.S. Um, have very different takes on abortion and contraception than um, than evangelical Christianity or Catholicism do. So it'll be interesting to see how that would play out. Um, I wanted to follow up with a question to you, Dr. Rothwell, about this specific situation in Oregon. As a state that is um, joins with Washington and California as being fairly unrestrictive and having a more um, progressive take on some of these more liberal sides of the family policies, how do you think that that may impact internal migration, Oregon's um, funding and provision of these services, or any other kinds of policy or political impacts for Oregon's policy? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I um, you know, would have to purely speculate at this point. I mean, I, I would expect, just as we've seen kind of coalitions of states form in, in response to the COVID pandemic and, you know, states like Oregon, Washington, California, kind of uh, pool together and um, and uh, go in sync, if you will, on, on some of the um, pushback to things that might be happening at, at other levels. I would expect uh, those type of things to happen. Uh, in terms of specifics, um, I haven't, I honestly haven't seen anything um, that would indicate that, uh, that the, you know, the federal decision would, would change things for, um, for Oregonians. I think the question that has come up in the, in the chat and that you asked about um, migration is, will be a, a real challenge that people would have to um, consider, especially from conservative states that we share a border with, um, Idaho and Utah and so on. Absolutely, thank you. Um, we have a few more minutes. Um, we do have other questions, so we will plan on ending at 5.30, but I do want to go get through a, a couple more questions, if that's okay with everyone. Okay, great. Um, one of the issues is um, how women, I guess, navigate the current um, legal landscape. Kelsey, you noted the variation in laws across the different states and um, where the line gets drawn. Oh, it's, it's allowed in cases of rape or whether the woman's life is in danger. What are we seeing in terms of how this actually plays out on the ground in terms of women's um, access to abortion rights? You know, as one um, audience member asked, do you have to prove that you were raped in order to get access to this? And so any insights you can provide on how this plays out on the ground and maybe Carrie, you can respond for Brazil. Yeah, I will, I will just say quickly, I think it, it's, it's a really open question how this plays out in on the ground now. Um, I traditionally, right, like, even if you support abortion rights, we are not living in a golden age of access to reproductive health care or abortion. And so there were, I just read an article today about um, abortion care deserts, where there are 27 major major ish metropolitan areas that don't have access to a clinic within like 300 miles or something it's like there are huge pockets of the US currently that don't have good access and this will exacerbate all of that. Um, I would imagine that if you were a person who needed an, an abortion in the case for any reason, but in case of rape those women those people will be scared to try and access care in their state if it ends up being a state that is um, that cracks down in that way. And, the, and as noted in the chat, that will push more people out of state and put more pressure on states that do have better access. And it will lead to some of the women who are raped, some of the people who have been raped to have those babies, to have to carry those pregnancies to term. I'll, I'll let Carrie talk to you. Yes, this is this has been a big issue in Brazil, and it's actually been one that's been taken up by pro-choice or, or reproductive justice activists in Brazil very fervently. Um, so, because it's in the penal code that they have a right in cases of sexual assault, you actually do not need to have a document from the police or from the courts that you've survived a sexual assault. Um, but the popular public thinking is that you do need that document because. Um, Brazil and other Latin American countries, there's a lot of 
thick bureaucracy around documents. So you need documents for a lot of things. And so there's just public thought, popular thinking that you do need that. And so that disincentivizes a lot of people from actually seeking um, to try to get that exemption. You still do have to go before a court and ask for that exemption, but you do not need, and it's important to dispel that myth. And as I said, activists try to actively dispel that you don't need documentation. Um, the other thing that's worrisome around that, I think that Brazil provides a, an interesting perspective is that um, when people present in a clinic, um, either, you know, on the other side of, um, you know, complications with an illegal abortion or taking misoprostol or self-induced abortion, um, that doesn't present that differently than a miscarriage, which can happen in one out, one out of four pregnancies, right? A spontaneous abortion. Um, and so that's also a problem is that people are then disincentivized from going to get care because they're afraid that their miscarriage that was a natural process will be interrogated. Um, and so that's something I see people questioning too. So that's another issue that I think clinics will have to take up is dispelling that, you know, don't, <laughs> you know, don't deny yourself care or how will we navigate that? How will people navigate that if there will be this intensified scrutiny on that. Yeah, I also read an article today that talked about how this could also affect IVF procedures mm -hmm. because IVF is, you know, fertilizing eggs in the lab and then implanting them. And the way some of the laws are written, that would also be problematic um, because, you know, only so many grow and how do you, the disposal and all those sorts of things. And I don't think that's something that people are actually trying to stop, um, but it could be um, problematic in, in those states for, for people who are difficulty getting pregnant and are trying to use those, those methods. I want to, this will probably be our last question, um, but I do want to end with a question that I want to put out there and I'd like each of you to speak to it. And that is how this fits in within our really turbulent and polarized political landscape. Um, you know, a lot of things happening as people are paying attention to politics with the um, rise in authoritarian sentiments, the um, gerrymandering and um, so much polarization um, there's some concerns about whether this is just continuing toward us toward a path toward political strife, toward um, violence um, and problems. And so it's really an open-ended question. How do we, um, how do we move forward with that? Where do you think this fits in with that? You know, how would you like to speak to some of those issues that are facing our country with regard to that? And so I'll just turn it over and whoever wants to jump in. <coughs> Well, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, this is Amy. Um, um, some of the research that's been done on white Christian nationalism suggests that actually that that is one of the things that's causing the polarization that um, the, the divide is whether or not you agree or disagree with the goals of this particular movement. Um, so that's one way of, of understanding it. But I think the way to move forward um, as a society, if we can, is to return again, at least as a historian, to a, a, an accurate sense of what our past is um, and to um, be very clear about that, particularly in our educational systems. So um, even dispelling mythologies like that, um, you know, there's a popular mythology that abortion has always been illicit um, and definitely illicit in religious organizations. And that's just simply not the case um, that right, most, um, most places allowed um, abortion, even through the colonial period until the moment of quickening, as they called it, and that religious organizations um, and religious denominations didn't immediately um, have any objection to Roe v. Wade, even the Southern Baptist Convention, it was literally the mobilization that happened around racial issues that made this a political issue. So I think just having real clear, accurate portrait of, of, um, of our historical precedents, um, not court precedents, but our historical precedents and um, could be very helpful if we keep this in the realm of what we know. Um, in terms of uh, politics, I think, you know, it's, it's going to be very difficult to get out of this sort of situation we find ourselves in. We're extremely polarized. 
um, unless there's some sort of new issue that shows up that cuts across the parties and sort of reshuffles everything. We're kind of stuck in these two ruts of, of polarization um, and between gerrymandering and the way the Senate is set up for, um, you know, two for every state, um, we are really in a situation where we have essentially minority rule. And I don't know how we change that. Um, the kind of last time we had a big change from something like this was when we weren't reapportioning every 10 years. And it was the Supreme Court that came in and said, you know what, this is violated the constitution and gave us Baker versus Carr, which led us to our redistricting issues that we have now, but it was um, providing us a shift. And by the court not accepting arguments about extreme partisan gerrymandering in the past few terms, there is no recourse to the Supreme Court to say, hey, you know what, things in the states are not fair. We don't have competitive elections in the way that perhaps um, was intended. And, and I'll be very clear that extreme partisan gerrymandering is on both sides. Both are, are, are very guilty of um, trying to stack the deck as much as possible. Um, and so you end up with situations where, um, again, a, a majority of the Senate represents a, a very strong minor, a, a minority of the population. Um, and then you can have games played with Supreme Court seats and that will change the effect of, of the policies that we have now. To be fair, if Merrick Garland was on the court, you'd still have a five person majority, but Chief Justice Roberts would still would be more along the swing seat and he'd have a bit more of effect. That doesn't mean that Roe versus Wade wouldn't be overturned because um, he's not a fan of it either. So Merrick Garland isn't the, you know, that's not the answer. Um, so to speak, but there would be a more of a mitigating effect and, and a slower pace, probably. That's just all I can add. I'm happy to jump in with, I can't say it better than Rory, but um, I would say uh, my colleague, Christopher Stout, and then Leah Rapaner wrote a thing earlier in the week, uh, maybe last week, it's a blur. Um, thinking about the effect that abortion might have for the uh, the monkey cage on the Washington Post and what it what was striking to me when writing it and reading sort of all the things to get ready to write it is that for as much as we talk about abortion and as strongly as everybody feels about it, it has not traditionally been a motivating political factor. And so we are it's a, I think it's an open question. It has not been a motivating factor in terms of driving people to the polls and and uh, it's not been a big mobilizer, but we have also never had this situation where it's both a major public issue that everybody has an opinion about and has been overturned, right? That access is gonna be denied. And so I think, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I think that's one of the things that makes it a sort of terrifying time is it does nothing happen because we're already as Rory, Rory notes, we're already so, we're already so polarized and because of the structure of the, the system, it, that's unlikely to change. And so this doesn't matter. I don't, I don't know what happens now. I think it's a really open question. Yeah, I'd say, um, Carrie, do you want to go or is it? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, I, I think when we, when I think about the state of America in, in comparison to other countries, the, the theme that stands out is inequality. And there seems to be like, you know, a, I don't know, a, a, over time, comparing to the 50s till now, I mean, just a, an increase acceptance and tolerance for inequality and outcomes. You know, I'm, I'm most of my work and, and focus is on what's going to happen or the impact of these policy changes. And so there's just this group, whether it's economic inequality, health inequality, or, you know, on reproductive rights, they're just, it's the story that sets America apart from other countries. And it's also, you know, growing to define uh, states within the country is this, you know, this, this notion of, very different opportunities depending on where you live. I'm going to be a little hopeful just because <laughs> taking insights from Latin America, I don't think, uh, you know, a generation ago, the people who were living through the very repressive right wing dictatorships in Latin America that were scattered throughout 
uh, that region would have thought that they could ever um, overturn the repressive reproductive rights laws that they have. And now we've seen those laws be overturned in Mexico and Argentina and Colombia. Um, and so I think we could take a lot of inspiration from those movements that were able to, to form really broad coalitions um, to you know, push their respective governments to make that change. Um, so I think there's always hope in that regard um, for building those kinds of movements. And maybe this is the moment that we can do that. The other thing I'm hopeful about is I'm always hopeful that this will move the discussion away from just abortion and that we'll look at a more wide horizon of reproductive justice issues. So today when I see people on the right getting all upset about baby formula, I think to myself, oh, maybe they'll care and start to you know, invest in policies like paternal maternal leave and you know, nutrition and all the other things that fit into um, the paradigm of reproductive justice. Again, maybe that's naive, but I'm hoping that it can galvanize those kinds of conversations and potential coalitions. I think that's a really excellent note to end on. I think hope is what we have to have and um, to keep fighting and protecting our democratic institutions and our democratic practices. And a panel like this, I think is an important part of our investment um, as a university and a college in those democratic conversations. So I wanna thank you all very much for your time. I wanna thank the audience for coming to be a part of this talk. Uh, thank you to the College of Liberal Arts, to Aaron Sneller and um, to everyone involved. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Goodbye.